rights of the poor versus the rights of the poor. Such Hamiltonians are very common in practice. 
Now, let's suppose I've got an H acting on some state uh, M like this, and this is the image of the E M, which is, which is not a general. And the statement is, is that N is also an eigenstate of parity. The eigenvalues of parity are plus or minus one, so it's got to be one of the two choices, plus or minus one. As an example of this, you might think of the ordinary harmonic oscillator. Uh, its eigenstates are non-degenerate because it's one-dimensional, and it also commutes with parity. And according to this theorem, all of the harmonic oscillator eigenstates are also eigenstates of parity. In fact, as you know, the uh, even ones are even and the odd ones are odd. Now that fact doesn't follow from this theorem here. You'd have to work with the harmonic oscillator to figure out which ones are even or odd. But the fact that there are eigenstates of parity does follow from this. All right, so those are some simple theorems. Now, next I'd like to turn to the subject of uh, projection operators. Uh, projection operator, uh, this is the definition, the projection operator, uh, or it's also called a projector, uh, is first of all an observable, so a mission, a complete emission operator, such that its square is equal to itself, p squared is equal to p. An operator that satisfies this property is said to be idempotent. It just means that if you raise it to a higher power, you always get the same thing as the first power. The way to visualize the projection operator is to think about the floor here like this. To think about light coming down from the sun over, straight overhead. And the projection is equivalent to the shadow of a vector. So if I have a vertical vector like this, it projects to a point, it gets annihilated, and just turns into zero. But if you have a horizontal vector, its shadow is equal to itself. So in this case, the projector applied to a vertical vector is zero, and the projector applied to a horizontal vector is the horizontal vector itself, like this. As you see, the vertical vector is an eigenvector of p with eigenvalue of zero, because I can multiply by p here if I want, the answer is zero. And the horizontal vector is that it has an eigenvalue of one. In fact, it's easy to show that the eigenvalues of projectors are always zero or one, because, well, here capital P is the operator, but if I let lowercase p be the eigenvalue, then the eigenvalues have to satisfy the same algebraic equation as the operators. So p squared equals p, and this implies that p is either equal to zero or one. There's only two eigenvalues, and um, it's obviously a discrete spectrum. And so in the case of a projection operator, there are only two eigenvalues, and therefore only two eigenspaces. And this means that the Hilbert space decomposes into the direct sum of the zero space and the one space. In this uh, shadow image here, the zero, the one space is the horizontal space, and the zero space is the vertical space. The one space are the ones where the eigenvalue is one, so the vector, nothing happens to the vector if you have to be on it, and the zero space is the one that gets annihilated. Anyway, this always holds for projection operators. Now, uh, projection operators occur frequently, uh, they occur always, as a matter of fact, in resolutions of the identity. Let's suppose we have an observable A, and for simplicity, let's suppose it has a discrete spectrum. So let's call its eigenstates N and R here, eigenvalues A, N, N, R like this, where R is an index which is used to resolve degeneracies, that's to say, it specifies a basis in the eigenspace E, N for the eigenvalue A sub N, like this. So R here runs from one up to the dimension of the nth eigenspace, which we'll call E, N like this, the degeneracy index. Then we know there's a resolute flow, and then the orthonormality relations, by the way, are the nr square product n of i r prime, or delta n n prime, delta r r prime, as I mentioned last in the past hour. Now, the resolution of the identity in this case is that the identity operator is the sum on n and r of the outer product of n r with n r. It's something like this whenever you have a discrete spectrum. Um, what we can do here is to define an operator, it's actually a projection operator, p n, which is the sum on R of the outer product of N, R, N, R. Here we're summing only on the degeneracy index and not also on N. So this depends on N. Now this is a projection operator onto the eigenspace E, N. Projects onto, projects onto, um, this projects onto the eigenspace E, N. 
How do I know that? I know it because if I let this operator act on any vector that's orthogonal to the eigenspace in the end, I get zero because all these vectors single lie in that space, and the uh, various eigenspaces are orthogonal to one another. Likewise, if I allow this to act on a vector which is in this space, I just reproduce the vector because this is a resolution of the identity inside the eigenspace. In fact, if we take this PN and just restrict it to the eigenspace EN, it becomes the identity operator in that space. That's really what a projection operator is. In any case, that's the projector on the EN. And the result is, is that this resolution of the identity here, if I separate the N and the R sums, let me write this way, sum and sum of R, the resolution of the identity becomes this, and then one is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues of the original operator of the projectors on the different spaces. And this is actually a statement of the completeness of the operator written in terms of projector language. All right. Another interesting thing is the operator itself can be written in terms of its projectors and its eigenvalues. It looks like this. This is the operator A is the sum on N of uh, AN times PN. Which I think is fairly obvious if you think about it, because if you let A act on one of its own eigenvectors that lies in the space EN, and the PN doesn't do anything to it, and the result is it just gets multiplied by AN. All the other vectors that are orthogonal that get annihilated by that PN. And so uh, this, this has the effect on, on, the, on the basis of eigenvectors that uh, the right hand side is the same effect on that basis as does the left hand side. So the two uh, sides are, in fact, equal operators. So, in the case of the discrete spectrum, this is how you express uh, both the identity operator and the original operator itself in terms of projectors onto the eigenspaces. Now, let me say something about the continuous spectrum. Uh, here it might, be, it might be easiest if we, if we just concentrate on an example, which we used before, which is the case of the momentum operator, the P operator, uh, or P hat as we were talking about it in, in wave mechanics. So I explained last time the eigenfunctions of this operator are plane waves, which don't belong to Hilbert space because they're not normalizable, but they do form a, a continuous basis. Now, um, let's suppose, so here's the momentum axis like this, and let's suppose we choose momentum value P here. And uh, this, of course, corresponds to an eigenfunction, which is a given, a given plane wave. Now, uh, first question is, does it make sense to talk about the, uh, the subspace, the eigenspace EP, corresponding to a single momentum value? And the answer is no, because the eigenfunction in this case uh, is not a subspace in the Hilbert space, because the eigenfunction doesn't even belong to the Hilbert space. It's not normalizable. Um, and so this actually has no meaning. On the other hand, it's possible to talk about an interval, let's say going from P0 to P1, like this. Let's call it interval I in the momentum space taking us from P0 to P1. And then what one can talk about is a projector onto the uh, a projector corresponding to the interval. Let's call it PI. And what is this projector? Well, in this momentum example, it's the interval of momentum from P0 to P1, the bounds of the interval, of the outer product of P with itself. Notice that if these ranges were extended to infinity, you'd just get the identity operator. And since it's only a finite range of momentum, what you get is a projector onto a range of momentum. This kind of projector should be familiar to you from uh, electronics or signal analysis. If you're working in the time domain instead of in the space domain, uh, the idea is that you uh, you know, you can design a circuit, you call it a filter, which would take a signal and reject all frequencies outside of a certain frequency range. Well, in the spatial domain, that's equivalent to momentum. And so the idea is you want to have an acceptance function unless the step function looks like this when it acts on some in input uh, signal. Uh, well, in fact, this is what this, so in fact, this is what that circuit does to, to time, time dependent signals. This is, this is really is a projection operator. And something similar to that being applied in quantum mechanics is, is this projection operator here. We remove all momentum components that lie outside this interval. You can see it's a projection operator because once you're inside this interval, if you apply it twice, you get the same, same result all over again. It won't change anything if you filter it twice. So in a continuous spectrum, we do have projection operators corresponding to intervals, and we actually also have corresponding 
subspaces of the Hilbert space that correspond to intervals of the continuous spectrum. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about what the resolution of the identity and the uh, resolution of the operator is in the case of the continuous spectrum. In fact, I'll even do more than that. We'll do it in the case of both the, the, uh, for the case of the mixed spectrum, where you have both discrete and continuous eigenvalues. This is the, as I mentioned last time, this is what you get in the case of the hydrogen atom. So let's suppose we've got A acting on NR. This is the discrete spectrum, this A N N R. So this is R runs from one up to the dimension of the of the eigenspace D N. And this is the discrete part of the spectrum. And let's suppose we've got A acting on, let's call it A R, brings out the value of A times A R. This is in the continuous spectrum. So that A here belongs to some interval uh, of the belongs to some interval which represents the continuous spectrum. Uh, furthermore, let's normalize these vectors in the following way. In our standard product n prime r prime is delta n n prime delta r r prime. This is a discrete normalization. And for the continuous normalization, we have A R a prime r prime is a direct delta function in the a's, a minus a prime, and a prime for delta in the r's. The r here, r stands for resolution. The r here is just an extra index, which is introduced in order to resolve the genesis if you have more than one linearly independent eigenfunction for a given value of the a's. This actually occurs in the hydrogen atom with positive energies, where you had, I think I mentioned last time, the states have been written this way. E L N, so the positive energies E is continuous, but L and M are still discrete. These are these are essentially scattering wave functions in the hydrogen atom with given values of L and M but positive energies. In any case, these are the real development relations in the continuum. Uh, and then finally, we have the orthonormality relations connecting the continuum with the discrete, which is that those are zero, those are orthogonal states. So the hydrogen, the bound states are orthogonal to, this, to the unbound states. All right, this is a complete set of orthonormality relations. Then in this case, the resolution of the identity looks like this. One is a sum of n and r, one of the discrete states <coughs> of the outer product n r n r, plus an integral over the, over the range of the continuous eigenvalues of dA, and then a sum over r of a r outer product a r. Likewise, the operator a itself can be represented by such a decomposition. It's a sum of n r of a n times the outer product n r n r. We just simply multiply each of these terms by the corresponding eigenvalue. And then in the continuous spectrum, it's integral d a, and we multiply by a, and then the sum of r of a r, outer product a r, like this. All right. This uh, latter form and last formula can be generalized uh, to give us a representation not just of the operator A, but in fact a function of the operator A. If I want a function of the operator A, I just take a function of the eigenvalues. <coughs> just replace the eigenvalue by a function of the eigenvalues. What this means is if you have an operator A and you want to find a function of it, you just go to the eigenspaces. And on each eigenspace, you just use the function, the function you're interested in, or the eigenvalue. Um, we'll see uh, interesting functions about non-trivial functions of operators appear later on in the course, including things like delta of a minus a, not even delta functions, which are kind of uh, 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 bizarre functions of operators. But in fact, these are these are meaningful to use this representation of a function of an operator. Now, uh, that's all I want to say about uh, the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics for now. And what I'd like to do now is to turn to the physical postulates of quantum mechanics, which allow us to connect uh, the uh, mathematical formalism with experimental results. Uh, we're actually not uh, ready to present the physical postulates in the final form because we haven't talked about uh, mixed states. Uh, so these are in, in incomplete form. 
I'll say in a minute if you well, in what sense they're incomplete. But uh, here's what they are. Uh, this, this is, uh, these postulates, by the way, are the distillation of, of a tormented history of the development of concepts in quantum mechanics. These postulates took on their, more or less, this form already by the late 1920s. Uh, so they're not exactly recent, but, uh, but the process of getting there was, was a very long and, and painful process. So they're not intended to be obvious, and in fact, they're certainly not obvious. But we're going to take them as given here as a starting point and see where they go. Uh, so the postulates run like this. First of all, uh, first postulate says that every physical system is associated with a certain Hilbert space, which I'll call script D. Hilbert space is a complex vector space with a, with a scalar product on it. Uh, it has certain properties such as its dimension, and the dimension of the Hilbert space is actually determined by the physical system. I'll give you an illustration of that in just a moment of how we know that, how we know what the dimension is. Secondly, every pure state of the physical system uh, corresponds to a ray in the Hilbert space. I haven't explained yet what a pure state is, and, and that's why these postulates are incomplete. I'll have to come back later and fill that in. So let's just leave that dangling for now. This is going to be an incomplete from a logical standpoint, which you learn a lot anyway by going through this at this stage. Let me just say that a pure state, roughly speaking, is a state which corresponds to a wave function that would give you an idea of what we mean by that. Uh, array, I'll remind you, is a set of uh, vectors in the Hilbert space which are uh, proportional to one another. In other words, it's a one-dimensional subspace. Uh, this is usually represented by some non-zero cat which lies in the ray. Uh, the, the, state, the, real, the correct thing to say is the ray itself corresponds to the physical state, not any particular vector in the ray. Nevertheless, uh, we're pretty sloppy about this in language. We frequently refer to a non-zero vector in the ray as the quote-unquote state, even though it's the ray that's the state and not the vector. This is because the normalization and phase of the state don't have any physical significance. So we just choose some dimensional non-zero vector in there. Frequently we make psi normalized, but in most of this I'm going to assume that not necessarily that psi, psi is normalized. The third postulate says that any measurement process you can carry out in the physical system corresponds to an observable, which is an operator that acts on the Ket space. The observable means that it has a, of course, it is a, a, a complete condition operator, yes. So is the correspondence always one-to-one? -one, and is everything in the Hilbert space a physical state? Is every physical state uh, element in the Hilbert space? Yeah, if you're talking about pure states, yes. Uh, and by state, you mean a ray, yes. If you mean vectors, then there's a, there's a set of equivalent vectors corresponding to the state. Um, the, uh, uh, so uh, the measurement process corresponds to observables. Fourth postulate says that the results of the measurements or the eigenvalues are the observable. There's two possibilities. It could be discrete or it could be continuous. Discrete eigenvalues or continuous. Both possibilities exist depending on the uh, measurement you're making. The fifth postulate says that the probability of measuring a discrete eigenvalue, call it A equals A n, or maybe I should say capital A equals A n, uh, is given by the ratio, which is on the top, is the uh, projection operator PN onto the eigenspace corresponding with the eigenvalue which you measured, sandwiched it between uh, the state vector psi divided by the norm of the state vector psi. Uh, notice we're not requiring psi to be normalized, and in fact, this answer is independent of the phase of normalization of psi, which, as I say, they're non physical anyway. In the continuous case, uh, we, need to, we can't talk about the problem of measuring the exact value uh, for a continuous variable because that would be zero. We talk about the probability of measuring A on some interval, let's say A0 to A1. In fact, let's call it interval I like this, capital I. Then the probability is given by the expectation value of the projection operator onto that interval, again, divided by the normal psi. Finally, there's the, the last postulate, which is sometimes called the collapse postulate, which says that after the measurement, the state psi, the original state psi, is replaced by the psi in which the, the psi with the projection operator in the discrete case, replaced by the original state psi with the projection operator Pn, which projects onto the eigenspace of the eigenvalue which was observed. In other words, psi becomes an eigenstate now of the original operator A with eigenvalue of A, A in projected on that eigenspace. Likewise, in the continuous case, 
if we measured A and Y as a continuous interval, then the projection operator is the one that corresponds to the uh, continuous interval. All right. So those are the postulates. <coughs> now, um, in their incomplete form. Now what I'd like to do is to illustrate these postulates uh, in the case of the stern gerlach experiment to show how these postulates can be connected in a real example. Uh, it isn't quite a real example. We'll be talking about the Hedonkin experiments. There was a real stern gerlach experiment, which has been repeated many times, but certain variations of it uh, have never been done as far as I know. So part of this is Hedonkin experiments. But nevertheless, you can take the results that I quote as being experimental results. I don't think anybody doubts that they, they would be true. So, um, so let's go through the, the, the stern gerlach experiment just using these postulates. Now, in this uh, process, we play a certain game, which is we pretend we know nothing about quantum mechanics except these postulates. In particular, we, yes? Uh, so, for the continuous spectrum, I mean, isn't the interval kind of arbitrary? We can make the interval as small as we want, sure. as long as it encloses A. So, sure. in, what, in what way is this consistent to say that it changes to the uh, P sub I of psi when P sub I is an arbitrary interval in closing A. I, I don't understand the question. Uh, the, the probability to make the measurement depends on the interval because if you narrow, the, if you just think about, uh, if you just think about a, a collimator, the measure its position of, of a beam, it's, that's really what a PI is in that case. If you narrow the collimator, you're narrowing the interval. The, the probability goes down, of course, because you're reducing the number of particles you're accepting. Does that answer your question? Well. I mean, you still get uh, a certain answer, A, right? Yeah, uh, no, you get an answer that lies inside the interval. The probability of having the answer lie inside the interval is given by this expectation. But you narrow the interval, the probability goes down. Okay. Yes? So in the case of, uh, uh, of a region rate, uh, if you make a measurement corresponding to an eigen, uh, of a region rate, if you get a region rate eigenvalue, yes. then does that Unique, take it to us, you get a unique state in, in the, the eigen subspace? No, uh, yes, you get a unique state in the eigen subspace. Uh, however, the eigen subspace is multidimensional. Um, there's other states in that subspace that have the same eigen value. All right? Okay. So in other words, um, yeah. So I mean, if the eigen space is multidimensional, we might get different output states depending on the input state because if I'm projecting on the table, I have one vector here projects this way, another one projects this way, they both be eigenvectors would give an eigenvalue, but they wouldn't be they wouldn't be proportional to each other. They wouldn't they would not be the same state afterwards. On the other hand, if the eigen space were one dimensional, then all of these would represent the same state because they'd all be proportional to one another. Okay. All right, uh, so yeah, so I want to talk about the uh, Sharon Gerlach. So as I was saying, in this, uh, we're gonna play a game here in which we pretend, pretend that we know nothing about the Schrodinger equation, wave functions, all these spin matrices, or any of that stuff. Stern and Gerlach didn't know about any of that stuff themselves. Uh, and here are the purposes is to understand how these postulates uh, can be, how they lead to an understanding of the uh, space we've been using. And unfortunately, we have to cover up the postulates in order to uh, get a board to write on. So, um, first let me say some things about the stern gerlach experiment. The uh, purpose of, of it, this was done in 1923, the purpose of it was to measure the magnetic moments of atoms. Magnetic moment, classical magnetic moment, is a vector of mu like this. It's determined by any uh, localized current distribution. And uh, magnetic moments, uh, so we could, in, in principle, you could measure magnetic moments of small dust particles with little iron bar magnets attached to them if you wanted to do it. Uh, they have definite magnetic moment, magnetic moment vectors, and you could measure them. That was the idea of the experiment. Now, a magnetic moment, uh, when it's, uh, it's measured by placing it in an inhomogeneous magnetic field, uh, in a magnetic field, the magnetic, the magnetic moment acquires an energy, which is minus mu dot b. And if you take minus the gradient of this in order to get a force, the two minus signs cancel, and you get the force acting on it. 
Uh, so this is the force on a magnetic dipole. It requires a non-zero force, requires a magnetic field to have a spatial dependence. The mu is characteristic of the particle, it doesn't depend on space. So the del operator really only acts on the B. Um, in the experiment with Stan and Gerlach, they used two magnetic poles that looked like this. One was a, at a sharp point and the other was flat, so there's a north pole and a south pole. The purpose of this is to uh, create a strong magnetic field radius near the, the pole tip uh, of the north pole here because you need strong radius in order to get a reasonable force. Uh, so the idea is that the apparatus would, this, this pole piece would go down like this, and so would the bottom one too, going across. And you'd run a beam through, and uh, the beam would run, this goes some distance, you'd actually want to make this a meter or more, if it's a fairly long magnet like this. And you have a beam that comes in like this, and you run the beam, run the beam through here, like this, through the beam. This is an atomic beam of neutral, neutral atoms. The beam, by the way, uh, they use the silver atoms. The beam, by the way, conceptually, is, is, is created by, by having a, well, actually, too, is you have a lump of silver in, in an oven, which would heat to a high temperature. They use silver atoms. Other atoms can be used, too. So they can get some silver vapor in here. The silver vapor passes through a small hole in the oven, and from there it passes through a collimator to create a beam of silver atoms. All right. And then this beam is passed next to the magnetic pole. Now let's say that the z direction is the direction of the uh, uh, vertical direction in this diagram like this. Uh, then along the axis of the, uh, the upper magnet, the magnetic field is largely in the z direction so that v is, is approximately equal to the magnitude of v times z hat. And thus this means the force on the atom is given by mu sub z, the z component of the magnetic moment of the atom multiplied times the gradient of the magnetic field, which itself is largely in the z direction. So the force is essentially in the z direction. <coughs> now, um, and so while the atom, atom passes through this, this inhomogeneous magnetic field over a certain period of time, over that time, this force, force times the time, gives us a momentum transfer. Momentum transfers in the vertical direction, so the beam will, will move, it will, it will pan out in the vertical direction, like this, uh, with an amount which is proportional to mu z, the z component of the magnetic moment when it entered the beam. We can assume that the, if the original magnetic moment mu, and the reasonable assumption is the magnetic moment mu has a, has a definite magnitude of the atom, has a definite magnitude, let's call it mu zero, and if so, the z component just ranges between plus and minus mu zero, depending on the, on the random angle of orientation. And so what you would expect classically is you'd expect a continuous distribution of, of a, a deposit of the, of the final beam on a screen ranging between a plus mu zero and a minus mu zero would be the two extremes. And you can figure out what mu zero is by looking at those extremes. Of course, what Stern and Gerlach found is something completely different. Instead of getting a continuous smear on this screen, they actually got two spots at plus and minus mu zero. And they were able to measure the value of mu zero, and it turned out to be in good agreement with the Bohr magneton uh, that was actually known at that time, the ZH bar of the two of the C, the numerical value came out to about right. All right. So uh, this was the big surprise, and it was regarded as one of the craziness, crazy aspects of quantum mechanics that you should only have two spots here. It seems crazy because how can mu z have only two components, plus and minus mu zero? There's nothing special about the z direction. You can orient in the x or the y direction and you get the same two spots. A classical vector can't possibly have just two different distribution of particles, can't possibly have just, just plus and minus components in all three directions that makes no sense. So uh, how do we interpret this? Um, okay, so uh, let's try and do this from the standpoint of measurements in quantum mechanics. Um, in the first place, uh, let's uh, take this beam from the oven and let's schematically indicate the starting airlock apparatus by measuring here, let's say, a component. I put a Z here, but let's say we measure the component of X, U X in the X direction first. And as I say, what comes out of this beam is, uh, is two outcomes. 
plus, which I'll just denote by plus and minus, but it stands for plus and minus the Bohr magneton for the values that are measured. And um, so uh, what this means is if we go to the postulates of quantum mechanics, it tells us that mu x should be a, 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 an observable or a complete emission operator acting on the Kent space of the system, which is the Kent space of the atoms. And, um, the, uh, and uh, since there are two outcomes, it means that the eigen, there are two eigenvalues of the operator mu x, plus and minus mu zero. And therefore, the Hilbert space decomposes into two orthogonal subspaces corresponding to these two eigenvalues. Now, we don't know what the dimensionality is of those subspaces. That's to say, we don't know what the degeneracy is. But there's at least two subspaces, so the Hilbert space is at least two-dimensional. Also, we get the same two answers with the same mu naught, no matter how we orient the beam x, y, or z. So, as far as making measurements of components of mu is concerned, there's no evidence that the Hilbert space has any more than two dimensions. The easiest way to proceed with this uh, discussion is just to assume at this point that these two eigenspaces are in fact non-degenerate, so they're one-dimensional, and then later on come back to the question of degeneracies. So allow me to do that. Let's just make an assumption. Let's say the Hilbert space is two-dimensional. If that's so, then the eigenspaces correspond to these plus and minus uh, outcomes are both one-dimensional and both non-degenerate. Let's suppose in this experiment we take the minus outcome and we just throw that beam away, and we take the plus, plus beam and, and, and carry it out uh, to, do, to do further experiments on it. In accordance with the postulates of quantum mechanics, uh, this, is now rep this is now represented by a one-dimensional subspace of the Hilbert space. Let's introduce a vector I'll call mu x with a plus sign. Mu x is the operator, plus is the eigenvalue. Uh, this is, we'll take this to be a normalized vector which lies in this one-dimensional space. This does not specify the phase of this vector, which is still uh, uh, arbitrary. So this is not uniquely determined, but we have to remember that. But let's just choose one vector in that space and call it mu x plus. Now, let's take this, this resulting beam and let's feed it into a second stern garlock apparatus, make this a tandem apparatus, feed it into mu y, where we, where we measure mu y in a different direction. The experimental or Gedanken experimental results are that once again, we get two values, plus and minus mu zero, and uh, they each come out with 50% probability. Same thing that actually happened in the first step, as a matter of fact. Uh, so, oh, excuse me, that's the, not mu y, let's make this mu z. Let's make this mu z. And so, let's call the states by the, okay, so after you measure mu z, then according to the projection, or number six, the last hy hypothesis, is that after measuring mu z, the state is projected on the eigenstates of, of, of the operator mu z. And therefore, the state of the system in these two beams is represented by two vectors. Let's call them plus and minus. Here I'm using the notation that, that mu z plus or minus is just the same thing as plus or minus. I'll omit the mu z in the case uh, of the z component because we're going to take that as kind of standard basis. But in any case, the statement is, is that the, the state of the system is now represented by either of these two states, depending which beam you look at coming out following the postulates. All right. Moreover, we'll take these to be normalized, normalized states. Now, as a result of this, we can take this mu x plus state. These two states now are, are give us a basis on the entire Hilbert space. And so we can expand this as a linear combination of the, of the mu z states like this with coefficients c plus and c minus. Also, and as I said, the probabilities here are 50% each. Also, the probability of measuring mu z equals plus mu zero, let's say, coming off the top side here, by our postulates, this is the state mu x plus sandwiched around the projection operator p plus, like this. I don't need to divide by a denominator because we're assuming this was normalized, where the p plus is the projector onto the the plus eigenstate of the, of the mu z operator. So this probability becomes mu x plus scalar product of plus times the scalar product of plus with mu x plus, which is equal to the absolute value of mu x plus 
scalar product of plus squared. But that's the same thing as the expansion coefficient C plus in this expansion, so this becomes C plus squared, which is experimentally equal to one half. And thus we conclude that C plus is equal to one over the square root of two times the phase, which I'll write as e to the alpha one, where alpha one is unknown at this point. Similarly, if I do this for the minus state, we find that C minus is equal to one over the square root of two times e to the i beta one, where beta one, or excuse me, uh, yeah, alpha one beta, I call it beta one, where beta one is another unknown phase. So by applying these postulates, Ux plus is 1 over the square root of 2. E to the i alpha 1 plus plus e to the i beta 1 minus. Like this. All right. Now, uh, allow me to, uh, in effect, absorb this arbitrary phase into the phase convention of mu x plus. I'll do this by writing this as mu x plus with a prime on it times e to the i alpha 1. And then we'll multiply both sides by e to the minus i alpha 1. And what we get then is that mu x plus prime is 1 over the square root of 2, where the space has been eliminated, plus an e to the i beta 1 prime minus where beta 1 prime is equal to beta 1 minus alpha 1. And now, if you allow me to do a dirty trick for lectures, which is to use the eraser, I'm just going to erase the primes. And I'll put a check next to a mu x plus. And what the check means is that we've now established a phase convention for this state. And we can't change its phases anymore. So with the phase convention for the mu x plus state, we can write it as a linear combination of the eigenstates of, of, uh, of uh, mu z in this form. Now, obviously, we could have done something with mu x minus, the other, other, uh, the other being coming out of the first uh, sharing element apparatus. And if we did, we could have gotten this, is that mu x minus is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 plus, plus, let's call it e to the i beta 2 minus like this. And I'll put a check next to that one, because that means the phase convention for that state is also determined. Now, these phases can be nailed down further, however, because we know that mu x plus must be orthogonal to mu x minus, because they belong to, to because these are vectors of, that belong to eigenspaces with the distinct eigenvalues. In this case, of the operator mu x. So this is equal to zero. And if you do a little bit of algebra here, what you find is is that e to the i beta two is equal to minus e to the i beta one. And so we can now combine these two statements together in this form to say that mu x plus or minus is one over the square root of two times the state plus plus or minus e to the i beta one times the state minus like this. This is a condensed version of the two lines above. And you see now there's only one independent phase. And the phase convention is the left side are determined. Similarly, instead of, if and measure, instead, if instead of measuring mu x first, we measure mu y first and did the same thing, we would obviously end up with similar conclusions. We'd get mu y plus or minus could be re represented this way, one over the square root of two times plus plus or minus a phase I'll call e to the i gamma 1 minus. And this would involve specifying phase conventions for the mu y plus or minus phase. So now there's two phases again. And what about the relation between them? Well, before I, uh, I, I do those, let me, let me uh, point out that at this, well, let me just say that at this point, it's convenient to actually talk about the operators 
Remember, the oper an operator uh, can be represented by a sum over the projectors onto the eigenspaces weighted by the eigenvalues. So, in particular, the operator mu x itself, there's two eigenvalues plus and minus mu zero. So it looks like this. It's equal to mu zero times the outer product of mu x plus mu itself minus the outer product of mu x minus mu itself. Like this, because plus mu zero is that eigenvalue, minus mu zero is that eigenvalue. And if you take this mu x plus expression down here and plug it in here uh, and do the algebra, you'll find that mu x is equal to mu zero times the following. It's e to the minus sign beta one times the outer product of plus with minus plus e to the plus sign beta one times the outer product of minus with plus. Similarly, for the mu y, you'll find that this is mu zero times e to the minus i gamma one plus minus plus e to the uh, i gamma one minus plus. And finally, mu z is the easiest mode to write down is plus plus out of product minus 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 out of product. Here, what I've done is I've written the three operators in terms of other products of the eigenspace of the operator mu z, like this. And there's still these two unknown faces that, that occur here. All right. Now, we can uh, proceed with these phases by imagining yet another uh, tandem experiment. Instead of feeding mu z into mu, uh, mu x into mu z, we're going to feed a mu x into a mu y. And if you do that, uh, again, you get two outcomes with probabilities of 50%. That means that a mu x, let's say the plus sign, is being fed into a mu y with either plus or minus sign. And the square of that is a probability. The answer is one half. And if you take these states here, with a plus sign on the upper side and a plus or minus sign on the lower one, form your scalar product, set it equal to one half. Do the algebra, this gives you a relationship between the phases beta 1 and gamma 1. In fact, what you find is e to the i gamma 1 is to within the sign, plus or minus sign, is plus or minus i times e to the i beta 1. So, uh, again, if I may use my eraser, e to the i gamma 1 here, I'll replace by plus i times e to the i beta 1. And the e to the minus i gamma 1 will make it minus i e to the i uh, beta 1. And as far as this plus or minus sign here, which is not determined by this formula, we get a plus or minus out front. And so by using these various combinations of tandem and Stern Gerlach experiments and making phase conventions, we can reduce these three operators to this form. Now, uh, there's still this final unknown phase beta 1. Uh, and we've pinned down the phase conventions for the mu x and mu y plus and minus. Uh, we can't change the phase convention for the mu z plus state because it would mess up this equation. You see, it would have changed the alpha 1, which is already going to soar. But we can change the phase convention for the z minus, mu z minus state. In fact, let's use it to absorb the e to the i beta 1. In other words, we'll say, a minus prime is equal to e to the i beta 1 times a minus, like that. And if we do this, I'll again use my eraser, and it just makes the e to the i beta 1s go away everywhere. Like that. And now what you see appearing here is the three Pauli matrices. Because if I take the operator mu x and I write it in this plus or minus basis, it's mu 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. The mu y is equal to plus or minus mu 0 times a 0 minus i i 0. And the mu z is equal to mu 0 times 1, 0, 0, minus 1. One remark here is that there's still a remaining unknown sign. It's only a plus or a minus sign. It hasn't been determined by the postulates or the experimental data. 
But apart from that, you see the standard Pauli matrices appearing. Uh, the Y matrix is turning out to be purely imaginary, and the X matrix is purely real. We could have reversed that if we had done a different phase convention for the Z minus state. If we put a factor I in here, then the result would be that the X matrix would be real, and the, uh, excuse me, X matrix would be imaginary, and the Y matrix would be, would be real. So one of the morals of this is, is if you can make one or the other of these two matrices real, but if you do, the other one has to, the remaining one has to be imaginary. This is, by the way, an indication, a proof that in quantum mechanics, it's necessary to use complex vector spaces with complex numbers. The postulates of quantum mechanics cannot be reconciled with the experimental results of Stern-Gerlach type experiments using only real numbers. All right. Now. Um, what about this final plus or minus sign? That's something that I will uh, let you think about. So I won't uh, there's still a remaining unknown sign here, but we're pretty close to the standard results. Okay. So uh, this is uh, this is a uh, an indication of how uh, Hilbert spaces are constructed out of experimental data, how one knows what the operators are based on experimental results, and how one can use phase conventions and other things to obtain standard representations for the operators. The quantum mechanics literature is just crawling with various phase conventions that have been established over the years, and for practical calculations, you have to know them and use them, but um, there's no physics in them, and, and the, the real physics is, is contained back in the postulates. All right. Now, allow me to return to the question about how do we know that these operators are non-degenerate? That, that, that was an important step here because it allowed us to use a two-dimensional Hilbert space. How do we know those eigenspaces of the new X operator, for example, are really only one-dimensional? Well, the answer to this is connected with the uh, concept of compatible, compatible or commuting observables. Uh, let's consider an idealized measurement uh, process in which we measure a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a measure an observable A. So we've got some kind of an input state here, let's call it psi zero like this. And there's a whole bunch of outcomes that come out. These correspond to what's called the discrete eigenvalues of A. Let's say one of them is AN, and let's say all the others we throw away, and we take the AN state out here and, and, and call this resulting state after measuring the after measuring the, op measuring the observable A on the initial state psi 0 and obtaining a value A sub n, let's say the resulting state is, is psi 1. Well, according to our postulate, psi 1 is the projection operator corresponding to operator A with eigenvalue n applied to psi 0. Now, let's take this psi 1 and let's feed it into a second measurement of an observable. Let's call it B. This produces a bunch of outcomes. Let's say we throw all of them away, except for one of them I'll call B sub M. And what's, what comes out of here is a, another state we call psi 2, which according to the postulates of quantum mechanics, psi 2 must be a projection operator for oper uh, onto the eigenspace of the operator B with eigenvalue B sub M, I'll call it PDM, like this. That's uh, this is acting on psi 1. And so this is the same thing as P sub BM acting on P sub A n, acting on the original state psi 0 by the possible exoplanet mechanics. Now, let's look at the probability of measuring, let's say, first A n, as we've indicated here, and then secondly, B sub m on these, these two measurements. This is a conditional probability, the probability of getting B sub m given that we got A sub n in the first measurement. So it's the probability of getting A n in the first measurement, which is uh, psi zero established around P A N divided by the norm of psi zero times the probability of getting B sub N given the first B, right, times the probability of B sub N with psi one coming in. So this is the probability of psi one. This is the scalar product psi one, projection operator P B M psi one divided by the norm of psi one psi one, the denominator here. Now, this numerator up here can be written this way because psi 1 is PAN acting on psi 0. Uh, uh, 
Uh, okay, I'm going to stop. It's a little over time anyway. I'll, I'll finish and fill the rest of this next time.